What's up everybody, I'm Jason and welcome back to the vlog. So I haven't done one of these in a while, but I kind of wanted to get back into doing some unscripted, just off the cuff discussions about camera gear, photography, the, what's going on in the world of photography and so forth. So uh, that's what's going on here. If you haven't seen this, if you're new to the channel, if you haven't seen one of these before, it is going to be long. It's largely in the form of, you could talk about it as, think of it as a podcast, uh, it's a vlog, whatever you, however you want to talk about, think about it. I do have notes, I do work off of notes, but uh, don't expect this to be as polished as the rest of the videos that I have on the channel. So this week I have two th major topics that I want to talk about. First is I want to very briefly talk about this week's video, sort of the extended discussion on the R5 auto shutoff temp video. And then second of all, I want to talk about uh, the news for the week, essentially, although it really was last week's news, which was or is the new firmwares that Canon has released for the R5, the R6, and the R3. And I'm going to get into some uh, detail and some discussion on sort of my thoughts with those firmwares and, and what's going on and so forth behind them. So specifically, I want to start off talking a little bit about this week's extended video. And this really is a, an apology in a sense and a realization and recognition of maybe I don't always quite hit the mark the way I should or the way I feel I should. So in, in retrospect, looking at the video, um, I did not do as well as I was hoping. I, it, I shouldn't say, it's not as good as I was hoping or I, I should have expected it to be. Now, partly this was a little bit due to time pressure. I pushed last week's video to next week because the, the new auto shutoff temperature setting is uh, new. It's relevant. It's something that you're... You know, I think there was going to be a lot of interest in, especially for EOS R5 owners, and I wanted to get some content out on that while it was still hot and new. Uh, so I, I, for lack of a better word, rush things a little. Now, I could have done a little bit better in that respect in terms of, you know, focusing... Regardless of the time constraints or time pressure, I could have done a little bit better in focusing on getting the points across or, or picking and uh, focusing on the points that I think would be more, most useful. Which brings me to the second part, which is I kind of got sidetracked, for lack of a better way to put it. So I... I had questions that I specifically wanted to look at and have answered. I was very focused on the external temperature of the of the camera. Uh, I wanted to sort of understand what was going on there. My thought process on this largely or that largely came down to the fact that you have to hold the camera. And if the camera is getting really hot, then, you know, how hot is it really getting? How uncomfortable or difficult is it going to be to actually hold the camera? I also got sidetracked sort of mechanically in that process. It's Recording, so testing for the high temp record time is pretty straightforward. You start a record, you let it run, you restart the record as soon as you hit the, the record limit or very close to the record limit, and you keep going and going and going. Uh, when the camera stops recording, that's how long it can record at whichever temp mode or auto shutoff temp you have it set to. So if it can't record past, say, 40 minutes in standard and it can't record past two hours in high then you have a data point for how long the camera is recording it's also kind of i won't say boring but it well it is boring it's boring to test it's a lot of sitting and waiting and then when the camera's done test you know getting to its record time it's sitting and waiting for the camera to recover to a sufficiently low temperature that you can do the whole process all over again in the process of doing that as i said i kind of got sidetracked focusing on temperature so i was measuring temperature every five minutes or so there was a lot of mechanical operations hitting the temperatures and 
in some respects, I think that kind of played out in the video in that there was, I feel, a lot more discussion about camera temperature than there should have been compared to record and recovery times. Because, yes, temperature is important. Uh, how hot the camera is when you're holding it and messing with it and, and so forth is a, a thing. Now, there was part of me that was thinking about low temperature contact burns and, and you know would this be a, a, an issue and so on and so forth i mean after all there are warnings in the manual about low temperature contact burns even before this setting was introduced and you know i've done some research on that and the exact conditions for that are not uh, entirely clear to me it's medical research they're focused on like really serious burns they're not focused so much on say low you know grade skin irritation kind of burns so you know it's it's like i just kind of ran off on that path and i really probably shouldn't have but as a photographer what I'm concerned about, what I think most of y'all are concerned about, is how long could the camera record? How long can the camera, or how long does it take the camera to recover? If you, you know, if I shoot for an hour continuous in the high temperature mode in a mo, you know, in a, you know, 4K HQ or something like that, you know, and I turn my camera off in five minutes, do I have 10 minutes of shooting time? Do I have 30 minutes of shooting time? Do I have you know back to like an hour plus that i could just go to how fast does the recovery end up being and you know another one that i probably could have taken you know some steps on is testing in a hotter environment so i tested it 78 degrees which is what the building is air conditioned to how does it reflect like if i was shooting outside where it was 95 degrees or something to that effect you know how are the times going to be different so like I said, I'm 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 talking about this primarily for me. Uh, by putting this out there and making a point of this, I'm really trying to reinforce and drive home the point to me, to going forward, focus, f constantly th rethink and remind myself, and focus on what's really important for people consuming the videos. Uh, I'm not gonna stop doing technical content. I'm not gonna stop doing stuff like that. But in a situation like this, testing a certain functionality on the camera, are the temperatures really important or is it the record time that's really important? If it's the record time that's really important, which I think it is, and I think I missed the boat on here, then, you know, maybe put some more or, or, or better focus the effort into looking at the record time. So, as I said, this is kind of an apology and... Uh, uh, extreme ownership of a screw-up, for lack of a better word, on uh, my behalf, or miscalculation, or however you want to phrase it, on my behalf for putting out this, uh, that video. I will do better. I will endeavor to do better in the future. So, the second topic, and this is the big one for this week, are the new firmware updates for the EOS R5, R6, and R3. I don't know why I put them in that order because it makes no sense, but whatever. So Canon issued three firmwares, two for the R, well, you know, 1.6 for the R5 and R6 and firmware 1.2 for the R3. So I'm going to talk about a little bit what's going on with those firmwares, what they've added, obviously. Um, but before I do that, I want to talk a bit about 1.2 for the R3, Canon firmwares, and the situation that frustrates the heck out of me with the whole thing. So... As I was getting ready to record this video and I jumped back on Canon's site, firmware 1.2 for the EOS R3 had been pulled. It's no longer available, was no longer available for download as of Wednesday, uh, July 27th, 2022. I checked Canon EU, I checked Canon USA, I started digging around on some forms to see what was going on. Apparently, based on uh, posts on Canon rumors, there was an issue that if you reset your camera, if you upgraded your R3 to firmware 1.2 and then reset your camera, the mode dial would no longer work correctly and you couldn't change between your exposure modes. So TV, AV, manual, etc. I This was a post on Canon Rumors. The poster said that they got it from uh, 
they're a CPS member in the UK, and this is what CPS UK told them. Now, to me, this is incredibly frustrating. It's incredibly frustrating because I don't understand how these kinds of issues continue to get past Canon's quality assurance testing when they do firmware updates. And the, as a whole, I, I feel like Canon's firmwares have a real issue that Canon needs to address. They work. Uh, I'm not going to say they don't work because the reality is, is I have two Canon cameras sitting in front of me right now that are doing exactly what they're supposed to do, and they're stable, and they work. But on the same time, it, it's also becoming increasingly clear to me that Canon's firmware is becoming, or has become, a convoluted mess of spaghetti code that's basically being forked into all kinds of different sub-code bases for specific cameras and specific functions and features. And that of all of this, there appears to be not so great automated testing or test suites or testing in general going on. So, and I'm, by that, I'm talking about testing at, you know, unit level tests, system level tests, integration level tests, and then putting it on a camera that is run through a test harness that tests various things and ensures things are operating correctly. You really shouldn't have this kind of a bug in a firmware that why was it even like what were they like i mean i guess what would end up broke breaking this was that they added a new button function in firmware 1.3 for the r3 or firmware 1.2 for the r3 that allows you to toggle between um crop mode or an aspect ratio and full frame and in adding that new button that would influence the whole slew of button processing code. And since the R3, like the R5, doesn't have a, a mode, a physical mode switch or physical mode dial, it has a software mode switch, that, that could have messed with something that would cause that to trigger and, and, and do something. But, and that's the only thing that I can come up with. But then why is this not in some kind of test harness? Like, this is the kind of thing that, to me, seems like it should be tested for. And you know, obviously, okay, yes, you can have new bugs that occur that had not been seen before that you would then want to add to your test suite to ensure that they don't happen in the future. I mean, this is just good engineering. But... I, I just, I don't, like, I don't really understand what's going on in Canon's firmware division or firmware engineering that it, it just, it looks like it's a mess. And it looks like it's a mess in no small part because it's been sort of snowballing for years and years and years. Now, this isn't to say that they need to clean break, erase everything, and start from scratch. That's never a good way to go about dealing with software. However, they definitely, at least from where I'm sitting, really need to, to dedicate a couple of engineers or something to full-time reorganizing and cleaning up their firmware. And, you know, this goes down to things like there are redundancies in the way that the firmware works, in the functionality, in the firmware. So, for example, on the R5, there are two places where you can specify aspect ratios. There's the shoot menu cropping an aspect ratio or the shoot mode cropping an aspect ratio or however you want to put it. And then there's another aspect ratio setting in the custom functions that's got more aspect ratios, but they're subtly different and they only are applied as metadata to raw files. There's no reason that that second option should persist and not just have had the aspect ratios put into the cropping thing that does it across the board. Another example too here is you have auto ISO, which is great. And then you have uh, ISO safety shift. 
and safety shifts ISO or safety shift the function is more comprehensive than auto ISO. So it, there is a valid point here. Uh, and but safety shift the ISO function in it, uh, and safety shift predates auto ISO. But safety shift the ISO function in it could have been rolled into auto ISO is the basically the biggest difference between safety shifts ISO functionality and auto ISO's ISO functionality is safety shift uses a 30 second exposure limit and auto ISO uses at most a one second exposure limit. So why not combine the two things into one setting? Plus you have the, the like weird dis differences between product versions that just I don't quite understand why they're they're there. Like, I mean, I get maybe product differentiation. I get maybe some of the like design brief, possible market use case, etc. But like, why did the R3 not have time lapse video at the launch? It got it in firmware 1.2, or it's getting it in firmware 1.2. But every other R series camera, the 5D Mark IV has time-lapse video built in as a, a just it's a setting it's got to be in the firmware somewhere of course the exception to that is the 1dx mark 3 that doesn't have time-lapse video but again why like why not have it there too like why wasn't it included there and then on the other side for example R3 users cannot specify the maximum frame rate for the various continuous shooting modes. They're hard coded. Yet that's a function that's in the 1DX Mark III that makes a lot of sense that that should carry over to the R3 as a configurable thing for sports and photojournalists that not everybody needs 30 frames a second and not everybody wants to just drop to 10 for you know, in any, any given situation. So, okay, that's my little bit of a rant out of the way on the firmware updates. As things stand, as I'm recording this on Thursday the 28th, uh, the firmware for the R1.2 for the R3 still hasn't been put back up. Uh, I'm currently not recommending that anybody who's using an R3 upgrade to firmware 1.2 until it's reposted and it will then probably be firmware 1.2.1 uh, but you know this kind of thing really needs to be addressed internally at canon and dealt with that we should not have these kinds of problems where firmwares get post this is also why i'm not a big fan of upgrading firmwares the week that a firmware is introduced especially in the case of like the R3, a firmware with as many new features and changes as they added. There's just too much margin or too much room for bugs. Okay, so let's talk about the firmwares. So the firmware updates for the R5 and R6 are fairly minor. The R5 and R6 both have, well, the, the R6 has, how do you put this? The R5 and R6 both share three major points or three points. Those points are, and this also applies to the R3 as well, uh, but the ability to add gain, the ability to uh, convert multiple HEIF files into multiple JPEG images. Okay, makes sense. Enhancement of the performance of movie digital IS so that it stabilizes the image better when taking selfies or walking shots using a wide angle lens. That's been consistently... I'm going to say consistently a problem. Image stabilization with uh, wide angle lenses, I've run into issues with that where the corners get really wonky because of the way stabilization works. And then three, fixes unenumerated minor issues. Uh, it would be nice if they would enumerate the minor issues, but if they're minor, whatever, okay, they're fixed. On top of those three points, the R5 adds a fourth point, which is the new auto power off temperature setting. Uh, I talked about this in the video that I released earlier this week. Essentially, it's the same setting that the R3 has had since its release. It doesn't or allows the camera to get hotter than it would normally do. Now, I got a question asking what this potential drawback for this could be. And I, if I wasn't clear about that in the video that I did on this, 
the biggest potential drawback that I see for using the auto power off high temperature mode is going to be a noise. Uh, it's going to be image noise is going to increase, especially at high ISOs and when the camera gets hot uh, or hotter. So image noise would always is always going to increase when you're talking about the camera getting hotter. In this case, the camera is getting hotter than it previously could, so inner no image noise could increase or should be expected to increase further. In my limited test of this, I didn't see a problem at low ISOs, so I was shooting at 800 to 3200, which is low on the video side of things as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, if you're shooting at 12.8 or 25.6 or whatever, then the ISO or, or image noise could be a problem. And that may be something that I come back and look into it or look at in more, specific, more specifically in the future somewhere. R3 update firmware version 1.2 is a massive upgrade compared to what the R5 and R6 got. And unfortunately, some of the things in the R3 upgrade uh, 1.2, I would really like Canon to bring to the R5. And I have no idea if they're actually going to do that. But uh, yeah, it would be really nice to see some of those features come to the R5. So... There are 14 points in the change log for firmware 1.2, and presumably firmware 1.2.1 will have a 15th point or whatever that fixes the bug in firmware 1.2. So I'm going to just run down the list and throw, you know, talk a little bit about some of the more relevant stuff. So the big one, I, it's number one on Canon's list, is adds the ability to set a custom high-speed continuous shooting set in drive mode where you can shoot from 2 to 50 images continuously at a speed of approximately 30 to 195 frames per second. There's a, so much stuff that's interesting about this to me and from a technical perspective and from an overall perspective. So uh, for starters, there are some limitations on this. There's no auto exposure. There's no autofocus. They're fixed at the first exp first frame. Uh, it's limited to a maximum of 50 exposures. As far as I can tell, in from looking at the manual and whatnot, the it's full resolution. So it's not like the Z9's 120 C mode where it downsamples to 11 megapixels. This is full 24 megapixel resolution. And as far as I can tell, you could shoot this in RAW or JPEG. There's no limitation, at least that I saw in the manual, that uh, limits what frame or what resolution or what quality image compression, however you want to put it, you can use for shooting this. So one of the things that I thought was really interesting about this is a, an actual like a reversal of Nikon and Canon's position, and that's specifically the auto exposure and autofocus lock at high frames per sec or high frame rates. The, the Z9 in 120C mode has full auto exposure and autofocus. Uh, obviously, the, the downside to using it is you only get an 11 megapixel image out of it. Canon never used to lock the auto exposure or autofocus when going into high frame rate modes. And in fact, it wasn't that long ago where this was par for the course on an Icon DSLR. So even cameras as new as the D5. The D5 could not shoot at 14 frames per second without locking the mirror up and therefore locking out auto exposure and autofocus cal uh, calculations. Conversely, the Canon 1DX Mark II, which is really the Z D5's competitor, it could do 14 frames a second with autofocus and metering. So, you know, it's I find it interesting. I don't know if, if like I don't know if there's a huge either way here, but I find it interesting that. Canon is now, Nikon in the Z9 is now doing the, we're going to give you the functionality, uh, you know, make sure, we're not going to disable autofocus and auto exposure lock uh, or autofocusing and auto exposure to be able to shoot at a higher frame rate where Canon's going like, yeah, we can give you a higher frame rate and we're going to disable autofocus and auto exposure. So that's, I think, an interesting, um, I don't know, reversal, turn of events. I'm not quite sure. And I'm not quite sure what the limitation on why that is either. Uh, certainly, the 
R3 can do autofocus and auto exposure when shooting 120 frame per second video. It can do autofocus and auto exposure as far as I can tell when shooting the new 120 frame per second or 240 frame per second video option. Now 240 frame per second video is only happening at 1080p, 120 frame per second only happens at 4K. Uh, well, I think you can do 1080p as well. But, and it, I, I may just come down to readout time for the full sensor resolution at high frame rates that cause this to be an issue. On that note, there's also, like, there's part of me that wants to call it lazy coding. Because in theory, at least some of these frame rates probably could have autofocus and auto exposure working without a problem. Uh, my, maybe even up to 100 or 120 frames per second. And I have to wonder if what the major impetus here was. Is the 195 frames per second the most important point? You know, like, look at us, our camera shoots more frames per second than the Z9 or whatever, or is the autofocus and auto exposure a more important feature for photographers that, like, uh, Personally, I don't know if I'd care if I could only shoot 100 frames per, se per second instead of 120 as long as I have autofocus and metering. It just, that to me, the 20 frames per second isn't going to make that much of a difference. Speaking of frame rates, the, the frame rates that you can select are not continuous. There's, it's not one frame steps. There are, at least this is according to what I have read. Again, I don't have an R3. I certainly would not have updated to firmware 1.2 as fast as, you know, Canon had released it. So last weekend, uh, I would definitely be waiting at least a week or two to make sure that there aren't any show-stopping bugs. But the according to what I've read, the frame rate jumps aren't continuous. So it's not 30, 31, 32, etc. It's 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, 100, 120, 150, 180, and 195 frames per second. And that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, yeah, I know I talk a lot about how giving people choice and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the reality is, is nobody is going to, like, nobody cares. Nobody is ever going to be like, I needed to shoot at 178 frames per second exactly, and 180 was too fast. I mean, we're talking about stills. It, it's just, quite honestly, everything over 120 is probably too fast for 99.99999% users. And I know there's going to be the people who are, are out there who are going to argue, oh, I shoot auto mode or motorsports and I need 200 frames per second to get the peak. At, you don't. We've been shooting at 10 frames, it's that kind of content at 10 frames a second for decades and decades and decades. And you get the images just fine. Uh, you know, and the, the, you run into really, again, diminishing returns as you go uh, faster and faster. But I've seen people complain about this, and I think it's a kind of crap complaint that you can't pick individual each individual frame uh, because it's really not that meaningful. The, the difference between 30 and 31 frames per second or 194 and 195 frames per second isn't going to matter. It just, it doesn't matter. It's too small of a difference, uh, especially when you consider variability of things like, well, we don't have autofocus and auto exposure here. So uh, shutter speeds, for instance, are going to be a huge thing that dictates just how fast the frame rate actually will be. Another complaint that I saw was there's considerable downtime again between or downtime between bursts. Again, this came from the discussion on Canon Rumor. R the reality is, is I'm not surprised. Like you have to stop and think about what's going on here, and the this plays into the limit with the 50 frame per second uh, shooting uh, or frame limit. In that the camera is only filling up and clearing its buffer, and this is something that. The Z9 has a completely different situation on because it's a completely different camera. So you're, which I'll come back to in a second, but so you, you aren't, this isn't, uh, 
basically from what I'm reading, what I'm inferring from what I'm reading is the 50 frame limit is however many is that many frames is how many raw frames Canon can put in the buffer on the R3 before the buffer is full. And since we're talking about doing this in a little over a quarter of a second at 195 frames per second, there really is no appreciable time for the camera to try and write anything out to a card. You're just not going to clear anything. It just doesn't matter. It wouldn't even matter if you were talking about, you know, card type CFast or CF Express versus SD. It just doesn't matter. It's there's so much information being ca captured in the highest capability settings. So 24 megapixels, 195 frames per second, 50 frames. That works out to uh, ignoring the 50 frame or the 195 frames a second, but that works out to basically two gigabytes of data at shoot push the button. The buffer's full. Uh, my bet is that in order to facilitate all of this, Canon's not even attempting to write data out during the shoot. The you know during the capture phase, they're writing it all out after the fact. So you fill the buffer up, doing all of this, then you absolutely need to have time for something to be cleared out because there has to be room for the camera to be able to do things. So not giving you access to do anything on the camera, basically busy, and you can't do anything for four or five seconds, to me, is not unsurprising. Uh, the camera has to start moving data out of buffer before it lets you do anything, and before maybe even it can do anything but move the data out of buffer, uh, out of the buffer. The question on AF, uh, like I touched on, uh, really comes down to, I think, read times, possibly, or maybe it's just processing availability. The, this is We are talking about moving an awful lot of information. I, I don't know. Um, but I do have to ask the question on this whole thing, because this really feels to me like... I, I don't quite get the point of this mode. I, I get the point of having a really high frame rate mode, but I don't quite get the point of what Canon has done here. To me, it seems like it would make more sense for Canon to say, limit the maximum frame rate to 90 or 100 frames a second, or 120 if they can get there, and give you autofocus and auto exposure, and, you know, maybe still have the 50 frame buffer or 50 frame limit because that goes back to the whole buffer situation but not necessarily kill you completely with auto focus and auto exposure uh, it just seems to me like it would be more maybe more useful now i did touch on and i'm going to touch on this kind of briefly but i did touch on why the z9 situation is sort of completely different so Part of that, of course, is the uh, so the autofocus side of that may come down to differences in frame rate that the camera is doing, but it also comes down to major differences in focusing technology. So the Z9, uh, the Z9 uses phase pixels and contrast detection. And the R5 uses dual pixel AF. Well, the phase pixels in a phase pixel camera, so Sony and Nikon, they're not image making pixels. So they can be wired up on the sensor to be read out separate from the image making pixels. So taking an image or making an image, whether it's for the viewfinder or whatever, doesn't necessarily mean, and I, I have no idea if this is actually how they do it, it's just theoretically what can be done. But Taking, making an image, capturing an image can be done simultaneously or read out simultaneously, potentially, from the autofocus pixels. On the R3, because it's dual pixel AF, everything is being read out for image making. And so to do the autofocus operation, the sensor has to be reset and then a window read out for the autofocus operation as well. So, in theory, 
on a camera like the Z9, if you're shooting at, say, 120 frames per second, the camera can do autofocus and the f actual image capture because the bulk of the autofocus, the phase part of the autofocus, is not actually inherently dependent on waiting for the image capture to happen. The, those pixels can be recording data while the image is expo being exposed, and they could be potentially read out in parallel in a completely separate channel than the image data after the, you know, at each thing. So you could, for example, shoot 120 frames per second with a sensor that's being read out 120 times a second and still have autofocus in theory because you're reading out the two things separately. With the dual pixel AF, why I think dual pixel AF is the better technology in some respects is that you don't have some pixels on the sensor that don't contribute to the image. Therefore, they have to be processed out and you know, interpolated around from surrounding data. Every pixel on the sensor either is capable of focusing or capable of contributing to the image. The flip side of that is you don't have necessarily that ability to not have everything uh, or you not you, everything has to be interleaved. So you'd have to do an image frame, you'd have to do an autofocus frame, potentially. I mean, there's ways around that, but they increase the uh, amount of bandwidth that would needed to be need to be used. You'd have to be able to read dual pixels from certain areas, and it it probably is more computational and complexity wise more difficult than to just read the sensor, make the image, read the sensor again, make the autofocus measurements or read the window in the sensor where the autofocus is and make the autofocus measurements. So I think that's probably what's going on with the autofocus side of things. I've you know no idea exactly where the the threshold would be. Uh, of course, for the buffer side of things, there, there's two things going on. So first of all, the Z9 has to have at least eight gig of memory in on board for buffer. It shoots 8K HEVC compressed or and AVC compressed, I believe, video. That means you need eight gig. So just to put some numbers to this, if you do all eye compression, roughly, and these are rough numbers, but if you do, or all eye, IPB compression, if you do IPB compression, for 1080p video, you need somewhere around 256 to 300 megabytes of memory, give or take. It's not a hard rule. It's going to differ between things. But with all eye compression, you need to have enough buffer space to store the motion estimation results for the group of pictures. So that will also change potentially depending on how many, how big your group of pictures is, your GOP. Uh, when you go to form 1080p to 4K, you double or you quadruple the amount of information that needs to be there. And in my testing and experience, that increases the amount of RAM needed to about a, to a bit over a gigabyte. Now, it's enough over a gigabyte that it doesn't fit in a gigabyte, which is why most cameras that support 4K IPB, either AVC or HEVC, have two gigabytes of buffer memory in them. And I think that's the case with the R5. It's certainly the case, for example, with a GoPro Hero 5. And this is also, in a complete tangent to this, an aside as to why on the 5D Mark IV, 4K is motion JPEG and not HEVC, because motion JPEG is just feeding data through the JPEG processor and writing it out, the JPEG stream hardware in the camera or in the processor on the camera, and writing it out, the buffer requirement for that is significantly lower than a compression algorithm that has to do motion estimation across a group of pictures or the IPB segment, whatever you want to call it. Technically, it's called a group of pictures or a GOP going from 4k to 8k so you'd have two gig in a, a 4k capable camera going from 4k to 8k you quadruple the amount of resolution you qua or if, if data so you quadruple the the amount of storage you need so you went from two gig now you're at eight gig 
Technically, I think you can get away with less than that. You need five or six gig, but you can't buy a five or six gig the way memory modules are organized and designed. You can't have five or six gig easily. You would, it's way easier to just go to eight gig as a hardware manufacturer instead of having like a four gig and a one gig or something like that and having to, to deal with that. You can just go straight to full on eight gig. So the Z9 has an advantage in terms of buffer space. Uh, it's obviously it's recording more information because it's a 45 megapixel camera, not a 24 megapixel camera. It also has an advantage in he, in sustainability or sustained shooting time in this case because it has that 11 megapixel JPEG output forced. So you have more buffer to fill and you are clearing it faster because you're writing far less information to your card. So a, an 11 megapixel JPEG is a couple of meg, three meg, four meg, something like that. A 24 megapixel raw is 30 meg or 24 meg or something to that effect, depending on compression. Might be a bit less than 24 meg, but you're talking you know, less than a quarter of the file size, more like a fifth or a sixth of the file size. So for every frame that the R3 could clear as a raw, the Nikon, the Z9 in C120 mode could clear four or five frames worth of data out of the buffer. And this is assuming going to a fast card, C, uh, CF Express or whatever. So you have potentially enough buffer space in the Z9 with the 8 gig that it almost certainly has or the buffer RAM to, coupled with the faster clearing of the smaller size, to make a sustainable, maybe it grows slowly because it's not quite as 100% you know, sustainable, but a sustainable operation. Whereas on the R3, because Canon isn't limiting you, as far as I can tell, to shooting only a small resolution or low resolution JPEG, the buffer fills very quickly and you just don't have the bandwidth to be able to clear it effectively. Plus, it's entirely likely that the there has to be a very hard limit on this because if you fill the buffer, you lose all of your temp space to work on, you know, other processing, manipulation, that kind of thing. That And that goes back to that, and the camera isn't responsive for a few seconds after you shoot this high frame rate burst, that things need to be cleared before the camera has enough free buffer space to even start re-operating as a, you know, a camera again, because it's working with the R3 is a 4k camera. It, yes, it shoots 6k in raw, but the reality is raw is a completely raw is more like MJPEG on a 5d than it is IPB uh, or long gop on, you know, a, any other camera. So, I think that's probably what's going on there from a technical side, I'm speculating a little bit, but, uh, or a lot, I should say, but, but I think that's what's going on there from a technical side and why the performance characteristics are so different between the, like the Z9 C120 mode and this new mode on the R5. So number two, going down the list, number two adds the ability to shoot 240 frames per second for 1080p video in high frame rate mode. Uh, personally, I am a big fan of this. I use high frame rate. I, I'm a bit of an edge case, uh, certainly, but I use high frame rate a lot for measuring things and doing testing of things because I can go back and count frames to see how long something takes. It 120 frames per second, you're talking about 8 milliseconds per frame at... 240 frames per second, you're talking about four milliseconds per frame. It's basically twice the resolution in terms of time compared to uh, 120. Now, yes, there's lots of other cameras that I have. My iPhone can do it. My GoPro can do it uh, that can shoot 240p. That's what I currently use when I need it. Of course, there's a huge difference in image quality between shooting 240p video on an iPhone or GoPro and shooting 240p video, even if it's line skipped, it doesn't matter, on the big pixels that a full frame 24 megapixel sensor has like the R3. So this is a cool feature as far as I'm concerned to see. Uh, 
Number three on the list adds the ability for in-camera depth compos compositing during focus bracketing and adds focusing bracketing and depth compositing with a flash and they put in parentheses Speedlight EL1. So essentially this is it does the focus stack in the camera. It saves the focus the stacked image as either a JPEG or an HEIF file. It also saves all of the images that contributed to that. So if you shoot raw, it saves all the raws, etc. Couple of thoughts on this briefly uh, on point one or the first part of this briefly is I wonder if this will make it to the R5. It seems like the kind of thing that should roll out to more and more or more of Canon's cameras. The, the R5 and the R3, as far as I understand it, share the same processor. They should have the same capabilities in terms of doing the math. And so in theory, the R5 should be you know, perfectly capable of doing this. Now, if the processor's clocked slower, it might take longer, but I still, it should be perfectly capable of doing this. My other question is, I wonder if it's any good. So I've always had issues with focus stacking. I, some of them work fine. Some of them, things are just wrong and I can never quite understand why. Uh, and then restacking the same images with the same set of images and things are fine. It's weird. So, I'm not sure how much I'd want to rely on the in-camera focus stacking, but if it works and it works well, you know, it might not be a bad, bad thing to have. I certainly can see how it could be useful for somebody who's in a, say, journalistic situation or whatever, where they need to be able to rapidly upload uh, or transmit images. Now, the second part of this is adding flash bracketing or uh, flash support to the focus bracketing. So... The R3, I don't remember if it had flash support previously, but it certainly has flash support now. And I had to dig through the manual a little bit uh, to find the information on this. It's on page 275 of the manual if you're looking for it. Now, in the description, Canon says it syncs or it triggers the Speedlight EL1. In the manual, it sig says it triggers both compatible hot shoe flashes and the PC sync port for other flashes. That's kind of, to me, a big deal. Uh, being able to trigger, you know, pretty much anything. So you could hook this up to your, like, Profoto Studio strobes and get focus stacking potentially with that. In a, you know, if you're doing product photography in a studio environment, focus stacking is super useful to get lots of depth of field. I mean, that or using tilt shift lenses. Be really interesting to see. Canon has patents now on and supposedly have products coming shortly or in the next six year, you know, in the new, near future, I should say, for autofocus tilt shift lenses. It would be really interesting to see how that stacks with, couple that with focus stacking if it'll work to, you know, for product photography would be really useful. So you could now have your big studio strobe set up and shoot focus stacks automated with the uh, R3. So that's pretty cool. Uh, unfortunately, this is one of those things, as I'd say, I'd love to see it come to the R5, but since the R5 doesn't have the way a way to trigger the hot shoe when the electronic trigger is being used or the electronic shutter is being used, that's a bit of a problem and I don't know if Canon could do something to fix that or not. I mean, in theory they could, but who knows. Now, the part that I'm going to say is done right on this is the way they've managed the recycling for the flashes. So according to the manual, you have a time setting for the flash, an inter-frame time setting for when you're using a flash. If you set this to zero, the camera talks to the flash. Obviously, you need a compatible flash. When the flash is fully charged, the camera will then shoot the next exposure. So when you're shooting a focus stack, especially if it's not a completely static thing in a studio, you want to shoot the frames as fast as possible because you're adding a temporal element for things to move that just isn't there in a one-shot exposure or isn't there the same way in a one-shot exposure. So you don't want to be shooting a focus stack of a bee on a flower and the bee flies off halfway through the thing because, you know, you just weren't fast enough or it's moving on the flower and it just wasn't shot fast enough and therefore it ruins your stack. 
So Canon's solution to this is that on the R5, R3, it shoots electronic shutter at the fastest frame rate that it can shoot. So 20, second, uh, 20 frames a second on the R5. I think on the R3, it shoots at 30 frames a second. That will obviously slow down with flash, shutter speed, etc. Now, when you're doing with a flash, what you don't want to do, if you have a flash that's capable of, say, recharging in a quarter of a second, you don't want to have to wait a whole second, ideally, to take the next picture if you could take the picture that quarter, you know, every quarter of a second. So four frames a second versus one frame per second is a big difference. And this should enable that to where the camera says to the flash, are we ready to go for the next frame? And the flash says yes, and then they shoot. Now, for non-canon flashes, you would need to up the timeout for something longer. It's uh, it's in seconds, so you would need to make sure that there's a long enough interval between flashes to shoot the, you know, for the flash to recharge for the next frame. So you now you're talking one frame a second, one frame every two seconds, that kind of thing. Number four, they've added the ability to shoot time-lapse movies, blah, blah, blah. I mean, as I said earlier, I don't understand why this wasn't in the camera from the start. The, it should just be part of the EOS code base at this time. It should be in everything because it just... It, why, com, why disable it in certain... Uh, especially in certain professional-level cameras where it's enabled in other professional level cameras. I mean, I consider the R5 to be a professional level camera or the 5D to be a professional level camera, especially since like on the DSLR side, Canon got rid of the 1DS. You either had the 1DX, which is really optimized for, for sports and photojournalism, but if you wanted a high resolution camera, you were either talking about the 5DSR or the 5DS or the 5D Mark IV. So uh, like, I don't, see downplaying those as anything less than professional uh, cameras. Number five, they've added the ability for cloud raw processing and raw processing is veil requires a paid subscription to the Canon imaging app service and da 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 da. Um, so my first thought on this is meh and then I went and looked at the pricing and the subscription for this and I found it to be even more meh. Um, so, the space subscription is $5 a month, and you're allowed 80 images to be processed. Then things get confusing. So there's the $5 a month subscription for the 80 images, but if you need to process more than 80 images, you can buy an additional, for an additional $5, you can buy an additional one-time plan that gives you 80 more images that lasts for 31 days. Now... The pictures that Canon has demonstrating this are okay. Like they demonstrate it does something. It works. I just don't know about the economics of all of this. And I'm going to compare this. I'm going to compare this in cost wise to Topaz's suite of stuff. So Denoise AI, Sharpen AI, and Gigapixel AI. Although we don't really need to talk about Gigapixel AI, but so those three programs cost about $200 to purchase for the first time. They're, unless you buy them on sale, they're definitely come, you know, go on sale. I got mine for less than 150. A friend of mine got his for like $100 on sale at Christmas. So they, they definitely, they're sales. So if you're savvy about it and you don't need it right now, you can do it for like a hundred bucks, 150 bucks. On top of that, they're, Lifetime, it's not a subscription, it's a lifetime thing, but they do have, if you have an existing version and you want to upgrade, you can buy a $99 one-year upgrade plan, for lack of a better word. So it's, if if you, you get all the upgrades that happen during that year for that next extra $99. So you're talking $200 to get in, $100 a year roughly to keep it up to date. You've no, no... Um, you have no limitation on how many images you can process. You could literally dump every image you shoot into Topaz Denoise and Topaz Sharpen AI and get the best quality for whatever you want, however you want to call it, out of them. 
On the other hand, we have Canon system. So Canon service, it's $5 a month, 80 images max a month, unless you buy expansion packs. So you're talking $60 a year. Okay, it is cheaper than Topaz. And you're talking a total of $960 or 960 images a year. But they're not selling the images as, let's just for simplicity sake and talking about this, say a thousand images a year. They're not saying you buy the year, you can get six, it's 60 bucks up front and you get a thousand images that you can use to process at any point during the year. The images are still being doled out 80 images a month. Now, I'm not sh sure, like I, I don't want to talk for anybody else. Personally, my processing is very bursty. I can have a month where I would need to process more than 80 images, followed by a month where I don't need to process any images, or I only need to process 20 images or something like that. So the actual cost for the Canon subscription plan is who knows, because it's going to be entirely dependent on how many images you need to process in any given month. And since you can't just like, you might only process a thousand images a year or 960 images a year, but you might process 200 in January, 150 in February, 100 in March, and then none in April, May, and June, and then July, August, September, October is 60 or 70 or whatever. Well, those first three months, you'd have to buy $5 expansion pack, or uh, yeah, expansion packs, for lack of a better word, $5 expansion packs to be able to process all the images you need, and then any images in that expansion pack that you didn't use don't roll over. In fact, neither do the images as best as I can tell, neither do the images that you, uh, neither do the images that you, you didn't use in a given month. So it's, it's just, it, it's, it doesn't seem to me like it's the greatest thing. Now I'd love to test it, except at the current time, just, just to see how it stacks up to like Topaz, Denoise and Sharpen AI. The, at the current time, you can only use the R3, the R7, and I want to say the R10. I have it in my notes, but I, for some reason I'm doubting that. But I think it's the R3, R7, and R10. I don't have any of those. I have an R5, so I can't. It, they don't even have support for it yet. So that does not seem like... I, it seems like this could be useful in some cases, but in other cases it seems like it could get very much more complicated and expensive and time consuming to have to uh like manage just how many images you actually are processing and you know maybe canon will do something about an unlimited plan or something like that who knows but i definitely would like to see a head-to-head -head of this with topaz or you know topaz labs software or do something like that but right now i don't have the cameras that can do it so moving along, number six adds the ability to convert multiple HEIF images to multiple JPEGs. So same as the R5 and R6. Number seven adds the ability to set still crop slash aspect to custom controls. And the assign button can be used to switch between crop and aspect ratio. Now, I'm not entirely clear on what this is doing exactly. I think what this is doing is giving you a one button toggle that you can set up so that you can switch from say full frame to crop mode at the click of a button. Because like the R5, the R3 already has the ability to set a button to you hit it and it brings up the menu for the uh, crop aspect ratio menu. And then you can dial through to the aspect ratio or crop that you actually want to shoot in. That works, but it's not exactly expedient. Now, if this is doing exactly what I think it's doing based on what the camera says, you know, what the description is and what the camera already has, this is definitely something I'd like to see on the R5. I use the crop mode on the R5 as a virtual teleconverter all the time. And with a 45 megapixel sensor and a 17 megapixel crop image, that gives, like, I still have enough resolution for this to work well. Uh, I get good printable images as a result of my shooting. So 
like I really do hope this comes to the R5 in a future firmware update. I think it would be really useful. Moving along, number eight, uh, adds the ability to crop and resize images during an FTP transfer. Okay, that makes sense. Number nine, 802.1x and WPA2 enterprise uh, authentication metho methods now support PKCS number 12 certificate format. If you don't know what all this is, um, the first two things are wire or network authorization things that are used in enterprise environments. They're essentially the same things, just in different places. So. WPA2 Enterprise is kind of like WPA2 that you have on your wireless LAN at home, except instead of sharing passwords, you have to give the, the network a certificate that says who you are, and that way every device has a unique uh, certificate and it's not a password. 802.1x is essentially the same thing, but for wired networks instead, basically works the same way. But basically this is stuff to make the camera integrate better into an enterprise style network. Number 10, adds an electronic shutter sound to be played when the mechanical shutter or electronic first curtain shutter is set. I don't quite get this, um, but it's a thing. Personally, I'm all for quiet cameras that don't make noise at all. I understand the privacy concerns, but generally speaking in the environments that I shoot in, night like wildlife and landscapes, uh, the bear ain't exactly worried that I'm taking his picture. And even if it was, I've got a big lens and I'm pretty far away. And so the only person who's really hearing the sound is me and the people who are next to me. And if you're one of those people or me and you're shooting video, all of your video ends up getting is click, 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 as everybody shoots the image instead of the running water or blowing wind. So I get it. I understand it. Whatever. I just quiet cameras are the future as far as I'm concerned. Uh, enhances performance of movie digital I IS. It's the same thing as the R5 and R6 got. Number 12 adds an auto power off temp setting for still shooting. I wonder if this has something to do with the 195 frame per second mode or if there's been some kind of thing that has caused R3s to not be able to shoot uh, in still mode. If you've had your R3 uh, overheat in shooting stills and only stills, like video is a different thing, but let me know in the comments below. I'm, I'm interested in that or why this may have ended up being a thing. Uh, number 13 fixes an issue where the camera displays error code 70 in rare instances when using smooth display performance. That's a good thing. Number 14 fixes minor un unenumerated issues. So you know, we've got the, the slew of everything kind of going on here. So uh, of that, like I said, there's a couple of features I definitely would like to see in the R5. I certainly think they can be brought to the R5 and they don't make sense not having from, say, a competitive standpoint or something like that. The big ones for me are the crop toggle button action and to a much lesser extent, the in-camera depth composition or focus stack composition mode that is, uh, you know, I think that could be interesting, useful for some, maybe not as useful for me, but definitely useful for some. So that kind of wraps up this week's discussion. If you found this useful or interesting, let me know by hitting that like button. If this kind of thing seems like it might be your kind of thing, please consider subscribing if you're not already. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.